I am a licensed in, a professional counselor, an independent counselor in Dallas, but I work with families and couples and individuals all over the nation and even internationally. I've been working with adoptive families professionally for 10 years, but I have a lifetime of experience because I am an adoptee and an adoptive mom. So I have a lot to offer on this topic, and I'm really happy to be able to share my knowledge and personal experience, a little bit of that with you today. And so if we're gonna to go to that first, very first slide, it says, are they yours? Four ways to support your child's adoption story. Um, and so what this is really important because we want to be able to have the right language and the right interactions with people over the years so we can help our child learn her story or his story and be able to communicate that with others as um, throughout her lifetime. And so if we go to the next slide, we can talk about how, you know, it was, there was a time where you were, uh, maybe you were pregnant or you're thinking about becoming pregnant or maybe you're still just on the early stages of the journey where you're looking at your options of grow, how you wanna grow your family. But where, whatever your story is right now, um, you're, you've been telling it. Maybe you've been telling it just to a few friends or a close friend and a family member, um, but it's definitely your story. And you know, maybe you've got, had some struggles or this is something that you planned all along. But either way, when the baby gets here, the story will change. And so it's important to know that when the child comes home, you're gonna have this gradual shift um, in your story, and it's gonna be, you'll, you're no longer, no longer just be the, completely the lead role, or you'll be the lead role, but you'll have this little understudy now. And so you have to be able to um, understand that she'll be listening and she'll be hearing what you have to say. So it's going to go from your pregnancy story or your, you know, your journey, um, maybe through infertility, to her life story. And so that's just important to keep that in mind as things change over time. So when we, that's what we'll be talking about in this presentation today, is how do we do that? How do we share our stories in a way that honors our children and honors us as well? So let's go to the next slide. And when you become a new parent, it's very, very exciting. Um, of course, we know it has a lot of responsibilities and it's tempting to kind of not want to talk about it anymore, about how the conception came about. And, you know, maybe you're not sure how to talk about it. You're not sure how to say it to strangers or to acquaintances or teachers. And so it's just easier to say, say nothing. Today, we'll have, I'm gonna be giving you four ways that will make it easier for you to share your story and things for you to keep in mind. Most experts do agree that talking about adoption um, and being open is better for everyone. It's better psychologically for the child and that that will be something you want to just develop an openness about. Even if you don't feel 100% comfortable with it now, it's okay. There's time to adjust and evolve along the way as your child grows and you become more comfortable as a family together. So we go to the next slide. So when you um, are talking about it, the, may, the most way or the biggest way that, that this will happen is when the child is not talking yet, but that they are listening and overhearing what you're saying to other people. And a lot of people don't think about that, that their child is actually taking it all in. They're like a little sponge and she's listening and processing and internalizing that story, her story, your story. Um, and this frames her understanding of it. And so there's gonna be times that you wanna share and there's gonna be times that you don't wanna share. And that's what we'll go into a little bit today is how do you set those boundaries without coming across like your um, ashamed of the story or you're closed off or you don't want to, you know, um, you, you, you don't want to expose your child in a way that makes her uncomfortable, but at the same time you want to have a foster openness. So that's kind of a fine line to walk and it takes some skills. If we go to the next slide, we are hopefully on the slide that says, uh, tip one, learn to share the story as you parent and this is both before they're talking and as, they're talk, as they begin to talk and grow. 
In the first few years, most of what your child hears, again, will be through how you interact with others. And she'll hear you talking to doctors and teachers, family members, and so you're gonna have lots and lots of opportunities to talk about it in front of her. And this is how her attitude will be formed, is through your, your interactions. We know that most of language is um, nonverbal. So like, something like 93% of communication is um, our body language and our tone of voice. And so if we know that, then we, we want to be really aware of, of what our attitude is because really that's what our body language is saying, our nonverbals and our tone of voice, that's conveying our attitude. And whether we feel confident or insecure, whether we feel embarrassed or we feel proud, you know, this comes through a lot in our, in our body language. And so you'll want to pay attention to that and just ask yourself, what is your body language saying? Um, are you struggling with part of this, you know, part of motherhood, um, any part? And, and if you're struggling with the part that's the adoption part, then you want to think about talking to a counselor just to help you talk through it, work through it, because any work you do right now on your attitudes will help your child in the future and help her to form a healthy attitude about adoption as well. Okay, so next slide. So developing a healthy approach to adoption is one thing to, big thing to take in consideration is how you change, how a human being changes and grows over time. Cognitively, um, their brain develops, they go from talking or not talking to talking and um, they're going to form social relationships and begin to communicate with others. She's going to have her own opinion about how much she wants to share her own story and how much she wants to keep private. And that is so normal for that to change over time. So I mentioned I was a, I'm an adoptee, but also an adoptive mom. So my daughter is now 12, so we've been through a lot of different stages of development so far. And I've definitely seen how in the early years, um, she didn't, um, it, you know, she didn't ask many questions, maybe a few here or there. And then now that she's in the middle school years, things have changed and she has, you know, very different realizations about it. And so it's normal for feelings to change over time and for children to have very different understanding of what it means to be adopted from the time they're a baby to the middle, to the elementary schools and the middle school years, and then on to the teen years. Their feelings might be conflicting. Sometimes they might feel happy and, and blessed, and other times they might feel confused and lost. So just knowing that's normal and that more that you can recognize that and be able to help your daughter or son work through that, um, the better off they're gonna be and the healthier they'll, they will develop mentally. So, it, this is um, one thing, one question, for example, is um, they might ask in the middle school years is, why didn't I stay with my genetic family? And, you know, they may have questions about the family and, and what the story, what happened there. And so you'll want to be prepared about how to interact with them. And then you could get that question from other people as well. So you want to know how to respond to other people socially if they ask that question. And um, there may be times, again, where you don't feel the need to answer that, but that may not be their business. So just knowing how to respond um, can be really, really helpful. If we go to the next slide, we are talking about social comparisons. And I mentioned how my daughter now, in the middle school years, is more aware of social interactions, of friendships, that and different social groups. And so this is a time where she really doesn't want to be different. She wants to fit in and be accepted. And so it might be a time that she doesn't really want to talk about it as much with her friends. There have been times when they have asked, asked her questions. I know that recently she, her brother picked her up and he looks very different from her. And from school, and one of her, sons, son, or one of her friends was surprised that was her brother. 
And so she told me about that and it wasn't upsetting. She was comfortable enough with it to just kind of smile about it. Um, but, you know, it can come up in the most, you know, the most surprising times, um, the comments or questions when, you know, you think that people already know or that um, it comes up, you know, at the doctor's office or even during like certain projects at school that are related to um, a family tree or genetics. So it can come up in times throughout her life that you want to be prepared to talk about. So if we go to um, the next slide, the, the second tip, tip number two is, it's complicated, so educate yourself. Um, adoption story, like anything, has two sides. And your child will come to understand this in his or her own way. And so that will be, you know, his responsibility over time. And, but you'll be guiding him. And so, you'll want to understand both sides. And on one side, adoption is a beautiful story of life, love, and family. And on the other side of the coin, it's, there's genetic loss for both parents and kids. So maybe as a parent, you have, um, maybe you've lost the opportunity to give birth to a genetic child, um, or maybe you've lost the story of the natural, um, you know, trouble-free pregnancy that you anticipated, um, or, you know, maybe there's, there's various stories. So there is loss and, and there's grief on, on, both, on the other side. And so when you understand that, then you can help communicate better with others. And on the next slide, we are talking about understanding genetic loss, um, that the, you know, they want children that are adopted um, definitely have a, a sense of this and they understand and they, they wonder about their genetic family, their genetic roots. Um, we know that, that some are interested in knowing more throughout time um, and later in their life and, and some others aren't. It really depends on the personality of the child. But it's okay to ask her questions about what she's feeling, um, if she's feeling sad, um, or if she is uh, needing to talk about it. Um, she may ask you questions about her genetic family, so you'll want to be ready for that. My daughter um, one time what, broke down crying, and I remember we were just standing in the bathroom, and she was very, um, she was talking about her eyes, the shape of her eyes, and, and she's Chinese, so we do look different. And, and she, you know, we were talking about that, and I was telling her how beautiful her eyes is, or were, and she wasn't liking them at the time, and and she was um, broke down in tears. And so I just said, you know, are you are you sad about, you know, that you don't we don't look alike, and and she and we kind of got to it. And I asked a few more questions. Are you sad about your birth mom, and do you wonder about her? And and she really just you know kind of broke down sobbing, and then it was a very probably only in maybe five minutes and she worked through it and we were fine and we moved on. But to be able to talk about it and just give her this area to, to voice that allowed her to move through it. And so um, it, it didn't turn out to be any more significant than that. So it was really, I would just say, honor your child's feelings, validate them, and even reflect back to them, you know, is this, is this hard for you? So in those moments, and um, that can be very helpful. So if you go to the next slide, um, well, you, not everyone's gonna understand that. Not everyone's gonna understand what it's like to have a, a loss. Um, however, some people will. If, if someone has lost a parent from some other reason, maybe divorce or death, um, unfortunately, then they would, could relate to uh, that type of loss. So, but then there are others that are going to have very much have misconceptions about adoption. They may automatically think that your child was placed after birth, and um, they may not be aware of embryo adoption. They may also be confused, your child may be confused about the difference and may not understand why um, she's being lumped into a different category. So, you'll want to... Um, be able to have those conversations with your child about 
what they're feeling and what they're experiencing from other people socially. So on the next slide, um, I want to talk about how there still is um, a shame stigma, unfortunately. I wish I could say there wasn't, but there is having lived this. Um, I experienced it. I continue to experience it in surprising ways, even as an adult. So, um, and I'll elaborate that if you want to learn more about that. So you can definitely contact me, and I can I can um, help you to understand that a little bit more. But your children may pick up on this negative stigma. They may hear negative comments at school or jokes about adopted kids. They may be exposed to other adopted kids who are maybe have some developmental or behavioral issues, depending on when they were adopted. Um, and they may be lumped into that broad category with them. And so that stigma can be confusing, and they definitely will want the support of a loving family to help them understand. Um, my daughter is very much into movies. She loves movies. And so we watch, we watch a lot of them. And you'd be surprised about the amount of movies with the theme of a parental law. And so these movies can be good conversation starters. I'm mean, sure you can think of a list just right now off the top of your head. I know Finding Dory, and I think there was a um, Storks movie maybe that had something to do with with loss, and then we go way back into the, the movies from the early Disney movies. We can look at at um, at you know stories like Cinderella, and um, we can even look at the story of Annie, Orphan Annie, and you know just how these characters tend to be oversimplified, and um, there tends to be these messages in those in the movies and theme in, in society that um, that can be confusing for a child. Maybe there's some inherent shame, or maybe there is a, um, an, a villainized character. You know, the caregivers are sometimes, or step caregivers become villains. And so that's very, very oversimplified, and we really ha are, the adult players in our lives, the parental par players in our kids' lives, are much more complex than these simplified characters that are portrayed in Hollywood. So. We just, again, want to be aware of that messaging that our kids are, re are receiving. We as adults have the ability to discern the difference, but kids don't, and they can internalize that into their adoption story. So it will be helpful to continue to have conversations and keep, keep that going. And um, that may be hard for you if maybe you don't want, feel like talking about it or uh, you just kind of want to say, it's okay, honey, let's just move on. It's they don't understand. And um, and so what you want to take a look at is how you have maybe internalized that, those stories as well. And, you know, you've seen a lot of movies and gotten a lot of messages over your years. And so you've probably swallowed, so to speak, some of the um, themes and the, the, the stories that have come across uh, your past. And so you want to just take an, a, a little closer look at your own beliefs. So we go to that. That's my next tip. Tip number three is inventory your personal beliefs. So um, just ask yourself, you know, do you have do you have any shame? Is there any shame left over? Shame is such a common feeling that we all all humans deal with. And so watch for that. You know, this could be unresolved grief. Um, you could feel um, just, you know, embarrassed to talk about some things. So if you have trouble talking about her genetic family, then you'll want to, to just ask yourself, um, you know, is fitting in important to you? Um, do you hope people won't notice that, you know, your baby looks different? Or do you get uncomfortable when people ask you questions that are seem personal? Some questions may be intrusive and they may be inappropriate. But, you know, even, even the ones that I've experienced that have been that way, I have to tell you, they have given me an opportunity to really process some unresolved stuff with, with myself and, and be able to work through that. So even, uh, even frustrating questions can be helpful if you're given the opportunity to, to look a little bit further into your own personal beliefs. Um, some of them, some questions come at the really wrong timing. They're very inconvenient. But again, that can give you that moment just to stop, pause, and talk to your child about the, the topic of adoption. And you will set an example. By doing that, you can set an example 
of, of loving boundaries. And you know, also being proud of your family and that confidence she will pick up on that. You also want to ask yourself, you know, just in general, like if your own personal family, your own family of origin, so your mother, father, how open was your family? Were there family secrets or was that pretty common? Um, was image or is image really important to your family of origin? And are differences in your family tolerated? Is that something that is embraced or is that something that's just not really um, accepted really well? So on the next slide, uh, the tip number four, you, there may be a time that you have to make some social adjustments. And so, you know, if family or friends are not responding in healthy ways to your situation, um, you might have to make some changes. And, um, or you might just need to educate your family and friends about the appropriate things to say and the appropriate things not to say um, in front of your child or to your family. The way we do this is outlined on the next slide. We do this through um, boundaries, establishing boundaries. And so this is a good way to prepare for these social interactions and develop the skills to communicate again in a positive, healthy way, um, is to maintain appropriate boundaries in front of your child. So you you want to um, not ex not allow certain questions or not feel the need to have to answer certain questions. So that way you have an open attitude still, but you're not exposing your child's private life. And um, that I, I really have learned some high level communication skills uh, over the years by fielding adoption questions. And so, and most of them are very well intended and they're innocent. Uh, they still can be unwelcome intrusions at times. So I, what I had to do was just learn to be positive and open and have a good, you know, open, positive attitude about adoption, but be firm in my, um, be firm when the boundary was being crossed and set that example for my daughter. So that is the challenge. So how do we do that? And, you know, the first way to do it is to recognize a violation on the next slide. Um, the best way I can tell you to do this is that your gut will tell you, your gut will tell you when there's a violation um, that someone has stepped over their bounds or someone has made you or your daughter feel embarrassed or feel shame or feel sad. That means that there has been a boundary that's been violated. Um, and that's when you know that you can be firm and you can um, take a, an action to protect your your family and your your daughter from that social um, pressure. And we'll, I'll go into some details on the next slide about how you do that and how I've done it over the years. But it is going back to your family of origin. You want to um, do an inventory and ask yourself: Are there boundary violations in your family? Is that common? Is that accepted? Is that expected? And so um, if that's the case, then you might have to do a little bit of training, a little bit of you know, learning, some skills on setting those um, boundaries and, and recognizing violations and knowing that that's um, not gonna be you know, a healthy way to interact uh, and, or to talk about your story. And so that, again, this, uh, this provides this the most incredible opportunity for growth, really, to, you know, and that's what parenting is all about. It's about growing and learning, and we learn from our children. We learn from these, these um, situations that happen, and we grow and become better versions of ourselves. So I'll tell you a story about how it, um, how, kind of just a little story that sums up the ways that I have dealt with boundary violations over the years. And, um, it's on the next slide. I've kind of summed it up pretty much with three, three or four things, and they're all D words. So it's my it's my four Ds, and it's basically to dodge, distract, um, deflect, or be direct. And what it's kind of an easy way to think about it, but I'll give you an example um, when starting with dodging. 
So dodging is, it, it actually works better with those you don't know as well. And maybe you all are, maybe some of you are really good at this already and got this figured out. But if you, um, if you've been asked an intrusive question, I, just, I think about the game of dodgeball. You know, to stay in the game, you probably all play dodgeball, or if you didn't, basically to stay in the game, you had two choices. You, a ball was coming at you. You had to either move out of the way of the ball or you had to catch it. And so in the game of dodgeball, you know, you can think of these unwanted questions or just, you know, any question, maybe ill-timed, as a dodge a ball coming at you, and what do you do? Do you want to get out of the way of it or do you want to catch it? And so um, you kind of have to be, learn to be quick on your feet. But, um, for example, when my daughter was three years old, we were in a grocery store check it out, checkout line, and a stranger behind me looked at, at my daughter sitting in the cart, and she obviously could immediately tell we, we weren't, uh, we didn't look alike. And so she blurted out, where is she from? And uh, I was, you know, very aware of children absorbing everything, and of course myself being adopted, I, I experienced this as well, so I remember these types of things happening when I was a kid, and um, so I didn't, I, I think I had, at the time we had a play group and um, a lot of the moms had experienced this similar question, where is she from? And some of the parents have felt like this was a question made that children feel like they were some, <laughs> somewhere, you know, from somewhere strange, like they were from outer, outer space or somewhere. And so, and it wasn't appropriate, this is a complete stranger, it wasn't an appropriate time for me to explain to this lady where my child was born and who, you know, the story of, of my parenting her. And so I wanted to, you know, basically handle her, not be rude to her and not be negative and wanted to stay open. And, but um, I dodged the question by saying, well, we're from here. We're from Dallas. So I included me. I didn't make her stand out, like let's put the spotlight on my daughter and bring a bunch of attention to her that she doesn't understand why. But we are here from Dallas, and I mean, I knew she was talking about what country she was from, but I, it, again, it wasn't the place to go into our story. And so you can answer a similar question, and sometimes that will satisfy your, your questioner. And that's a way to communicate boundaries is you answer a similar question. So I just said, we're from Dallas. If you can't dodge the question, you can try another t technique that I teach my clients, and that kind of catches the ball. It kind of catches them at their game. And that is simply to repeat, have them repeat the question. So she asked me the question, where is she from? And I look to her and I say, I'm sorry, what was that you said? And so that gives her an opportunity to either think about the question, like was that the right question to ask, or um, it gives you time to think about what you're going to say as well. So sometimes when people hear, have to repeat the question twice, they have an opportunity to, to realize their social misstep, and they might rephrase it for you or just drop it. Um, but if they continue with the question and you still don't want to uh, answer it, then I um, move into a technique of distraction. And Distraction is basically a way to prevent someone from giving their full attention to something. And so you're going to divert their mind. You're going to change the subject or give them something else um, to think about or give something else your attention. For example, some people will, you know, you can have a, a cell phone ringing or maybe um, a, you know, you get something that comes on your phone that can distract you, or maybe the doorbell rings, or um, maybe there's a commotion at the, the grocery store checkout line that you can divert your attention to. It, it can be something very simple. And so, you know, it, it's proven that our minds are easily distracted by activity, and so you can actually very easily distract somebody, um, and they usually will just drop their original question um, and continue on with their activity. So, and then of course, you would purposely avoid circling back to the subject. Um, most questioners will, will take this little subtle so social cue, because it is a very subtle social cue, and most of them will get the hint and move on. So, again, things like, 
I think I hear, you know, the baby crying or I need to check the oven or, you know, look at this funny text I just got. I mean, these are ways that you can um, divert someone's attention or distract them from a, an inappropriate or ill-timed question that, that you do not want to answer in front of your child or that's just too intrusive into your family um, story. So now what happens if um, you're cornered in a quiet place and there's no simple distraction, that's not an option. Then another technique that you can try is deflecting or deflection. And that basically changes the direction of the original question, of the focus of the question. So in my grocery store example, the stranger behind me persisted. She actually did. She's an older lady. And she said, um, no, I mean, what country is she from? And she, then she went on to say, I have a granddaughter from Korea. So this is a really important thing to point out because I've learned over the years that most questions really are coming from that person's place of self-motivation and they have good intentions. They really do. And they usually are looking for a way that they are relating to you and they have a story to share too. So, um, what I understood in that moment is that this lady really just wanted to share hers rather than go into my own personal adoption story in front of my daughter and talk about it in public. I simply deflected the question by saying, oh, you do? Well, how old is your granddaughter? So I gave her an opportunity to talk about herself. So this was a way, again, to stay open and stay positive and, and, and have that, you know, openness about it, but not necessarily feel like you have to divulge everything about your own personal life um, to strangers. Um, so you can focus on a different part of the question and, and continue the conversation. So you know, then what happens in, in this such situation where, um, you know, let's say in this situation it didn't happen this way, but let's say this lady then said, oh, well, my granddaughter is now 17. How much did it cost to get yours? <laughs> um, then you would go, okay, you know, we, we know right straight up there, we don't want to talk about cost and how much it costs to get a person because that's not how it works and that's not really, that's a misunderstanding. Um, and we certainly don't want our, my three-year-old daughter to hear about her life in terms of a price. So that's an opportunity where I would just leap and just, you know, maybe say, oh, no, we'll be, you know, the process costs this much, and to, to add some clarification. But, um, you know, there's a ways you can be direct about it and say, you know, you could even say to her, how kind of you to ask, but we don't talk about personal matters with people we just met. <laughs> so um, if that's your style, hey, go for it. That works too. And um, that is a great way to set boundaries with in front of your child so she can learn how to uh, approach these questions or handle these questions for the next the rest of, of her life. So um, if we go on to the next slide, and I'm sorry if I'm moving too quickly, but I wanted, wanted to catch up and make sure we had time for questions at the end. But if we go to the next slide, this, we're, we're basically looking at, you know, the goal is to have a well-adjusted family. We want to, um, we want to be able for our child to have a healthy, and, positive, for the most part, positive attitude about um, their story and, you know, knowing that there will be some, some losses and some grief and, and some challenges along the way, but knowing that we can handle them, um, we can handle them well and we can give our, our children the, t the tools and the skills they need to navigate life. Um, there are two concepts I want to just introduce to you. They are um, dialectical thinking, and that basically is just means that, that there are two opposing ideas and that they can actually be true at the same time. So we're just thinking about opposites. And it's kind of, you think back to that two-sided coin, it's basically looking that if we look at two um, concepts that seem to be opposite, where here I am in this loving, wonderful, happy family, but on the other hand, I'm sad that I lost my original genetic connection, that those are opposing ideas, but that we can actually merge those ideas into one that makes sense and that we can examine the opposite and understand the world and the people in it 
by doing that. So it's a, an important part of developing empathy, actually, because the person that's using that type of thinking has to consider each opposite. And they have to look at these two um, opposites to, to understand and to resolve conflict. And so, you know, we, there's more than one way to think about a situation. All people have something unique and different to offer. And um, both positive and negative aspects are all necessary and they're all valuable. So it's hard to accept, you know, some of the things that happen in our lives. But again, as we look at these two concepts, we allow, it allows for balance between acceptance and change, and both of which are necessary for establishing a fulfilling life. So this is something that as you, um, as you answer questions and you raise your child, that your adopted child will have and will develop a, um, a way of dialectical thinking and emerging opposing ideas. And that is a high, high level skill for living out the rest of their life because it is what we have, we eventually all come to terms with um, as we age. And so, this is one of the real upsides to uh, being adopted. And for, for me personally, for my daughter, is that we have this skill set and this ability to do this. And then, you know, the other, the other term is, dis, is called distinguishing behaviors. And that is that, that means that families that tend to be the most well-adjusted, adoptive families have learned to accept both the um, ways that they are similar to their adopted child and the ways that their adopted child is uniquely him or herself and that she has her own traits and skills and interests and um, that might be different from you. And so adoptive families celebrate that, that are able to celebrate that, feel comfortable with that, um, tend to have very well adjusted children. And so, you know, if you find that you're threatened by anything that's, that by your child being different in any way or it makes you feel sad, then definitely talk to someone because this is, again, leftover grief and, and leftover um, pain that you may have and it may be making it challenging to accept that. But it's something that can absolutely be worked through and can absolutely heal from. And so that will give you the ability to do that even more so. And once you've healed your own grief and then you can be able to accept the child for for who she is fully as well yes do you make mistakes absolutely we're going to make mistakes it's life i mean we i've made some fine mistakes and that is part of it and i would expect that and you know there's a lot of trial and error and there's a lot of time to work out the details so don't feel overwhelmed by by the task that you have or by anything that i've Said today, um, and know that with adoption, you know you're gonna you can set a positive yet realistic um, tone for it. You're gonna the you know the theme is overcoming adversity instead of shame and learning to handle contradictions with a loving family. And you know overall, it's about love. 